In 2000, J. Craig Venter led Celera Genomics in co-publishing the first draft of the human genome alongside the NIH-led Human Genome Sequencing Consortium. Genome Web Editorial Director Ben Butkus spoke to Venter about what we've learned since and what hurdles remain to translate the human genome into medical breakthroughs. Genome Web's 25th anniversary essentially coincides with the co-publication of the first draft of the human genome by your former company, Celera Genomics, and the NIH-led International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium. At the time, the thought was that this would change human medicine forever. Do you think that that potential has been fully realized? Uh, unfortunately, it's fallen uh, far short, but it's had a huge impact. Um, uh, it's hard to identify a pharmaceutical today that uh, wasn't impacted in its development by having the human genome. But uh, the biggest surprise is after 25 years, we're missing 60% of the heritability um, from doing a lot of short read sequencing and, and geneticists thinking that SNPs would explain everything. So we're, uh, the, the progress and the lack of progress um, uh, are pretty astounding. What do you think have been the biggest hurdles so far to fully realizing the potential of having this information? And what, what do you think needs to be done to clear those hurdles? Well, it starts with some of the underlying assumptions. So, as you know, genetics has been uh, uh, loaded with, you know, Strange simplifying assumptions, you know, before we sequenced the first draft, uh, people were arguing whether there are 100 or 300,000 genes, because geneticists won a, a gene for every trait and symptom. Uh, and I think the biggest shock to the world was uh, when we're not much different from fruit flies or anything else, uh, having 20 some odd thousand uh, genes. Um, so the simplifying assumption was that SNPs would explain virtually everything in genetics. The second component was uh, to actually sequence the first draft of the human genome, we actually had to uh, independently assemble it. There was nothing to line it up on, nothing to compare to. Uh, that's why Gene Meyer's work was so important for developing uh, the uh, complex algorithms that assembled the first uh, human genome. But shortly after that, uh, Illumina became highly successful by bringing down the cost of sequencing very dramatically. And, and that is responsible for expanding sequencing uh, across the globe. Um, but their technology just produces very short reads, and you can't assemble a genome uh, from the short read sequences. Uh, so, because there was uh, versions of assembled genomes out there, uh, for the last 25 years, people have been just layering the short reads onto reference genomes. Um, uh, my genome and my genome combined with public data uh, for a long time. So, people could find out how similar or different they were to me. Uh, which isn't necessarily uh, uh, the, the ideal for understanding uh, human genetics. Uh, but uh, the short reads were great for identifying SNPs, but now after uh, over 2 million uh, short read genomes, uh, I think uh, the biggest finding in the last 25 years is that up to 60% of heritability is missing from the short read and SNP data. Now, in uh, 2007, we published the first uh, diploid human genome uh, out of the Venture Institute. It was actually my genome, um, but it's the first and last genome that was sequenced with Sanger technology, which everybody was using back in uh, 99 and 2000. Um, but to get to a phase diploid genome, we had to sequence a uh, significant number of genomes from individual sperm cells, uh, sperm being haploid. And so that's how we got the phasing uh, between my maternal and paternal chromosomes. But overall, if you count all the raw data that went in, 
that we used also from Solera. Uh, that experiment probably cost on the order of $40 million. So uh, it, it didn't leave anybody likely to reproduce it. Uh, and then with the short read sequencing, nobody could reproduce it. Uh, so we've been sort of caught in this uh, short read sequence snip loop. Well, that's discovered a lot of links to things. Uh, if you ask people 10 years ago whether they wanted their genome sequenced, uh, people were pretty excited about that prospect. Today, you get a totally different answer. The answer is usually, I, I don't think it will tell me anything. Uh, so, no. Very interesting. Do you see any game-changing technologies on the horizon that promise to have as big of an impact on the field of human medicine as next generation sequencing has so far? Well, we're, we're already there with both PacBio and also with Oxford Nanopore. Uh, those technologies have been around for a while, but they've really greatly improved over the past decade uh, to the point of being highly accurate and producing very long reads both which allow independent telomere to telomere assembly of genomes. So that's what we're currently using as we scale up uh, full diploid uh, genomes. Um, they're both single molecule sequencing and uh, PacBio is slightly more accurate, but uh, Oxford is uh, continually improving and not far behind. So Oxford has the advantage of doing extremely long reads that help us uh, line up haplotype blocks to do uh, uh, diploid uh, uh, sequencing and phasing. You are the founder, chairman, and CEO of a nonprofit, the J. Craig Venter Institute, which relies heavily on government funding. But you are also a serial entrepreneur that has founded several private companies. So you have both perspectives. Can you give us a little bit of your perspective on the current funding environment for genomics and omics in general? Well, we're, we're trying to understand, like everybody else, what the what it really is. Congress has always been supportive of NIH and science. Uh, Republican administrations have been more favorable in general than Democratic administrations for NIH funding and science funding, uh, which may sound surprising to people. But uh, and, and from what we can tell, the, the current mood uh, in, in Congress is not to uh, go along with the very dramatic slush, slices uh, to uh, science funding and to NIH. Um, but it remains to be seen. Uh, not for profit research institutes like the Venture Institute uh, and five or six others just in La Jolla with the Salk Institute and Burnham, et cetera, uh, rely totally on indirect costs to pay our bills. Whereas I understand some of the frustration with indirect costs at universities. Uh, they're used for building funds. They're used for various things. We use them to pay our bills and survive. So <clears throat> the, the future could be uh, if indirect costs get cut at the proposed level of 15%, there'll be roughly 40,000 scientists uh, unemployed over the next couple of years as institutes like mine have to shut down. Uh, there's very few with really large endowments that can survive uh, funding cuts. Um, uh, so research institutes are in a different position uh, than universities are, particularly the universities with very large endowments. Depending on what Congress does, it could either uh, uh, be science is going to continue to grow and America will maintain its leadership, uh, or we'll see uh, the worst hit ever uh, to modern day science. <laughs> 